Ladies and gentlemen, please welcome Frank Fannin, Assistant Secretary, Bureau of Energy Resources, United States Department of State, and Ambassador Paula Dobriansky. Harvard University, Atlantic Council board member. Good afternoon, everyone. We're very delighted to be here, and we want to welcome the Assistant Secretary. We're delighted that you could be here at this Atlantic Council and here in Abu Dhabi, this Global Energy Summit. We want to go right to the heart of the issue and find out from you what are your priorities? What's uppermost in your mind on energy policy these days? Yeah, thank you. Thank you, Atlantic Council, and thank you, Paula. Uh, it's uh, a real delight to be here. Um, I'm going to walk through really quickly a, a couple of different uh, focus areas that uh, we're, we're really uh, our top priorities. As a matter of course, we're always uh, out there to support uh, U.S. companies, of course, all around the world. But in terms of the policy specifics, uh, first, uh, issues around transatlantic energy security. Uh, we deeply believe uh, in creating a level playing field and no single uh, supplier of energy should be able to use that energy for uh, malign uh, means. Second, uh, we're focused on uh, areas of great promise, such as the Eastern Mediterranean energy development. Uh, the, what's going on there is, is, is just fantastic, and it has the potential to be uh, a real game changer in terms of energy uh, markets, uh, but also uh, as a best practice in, in cooperation. Third, uh, we're looking at, we've heard a lot here today, and of course, also going on is IRENA, uh, the issues around energy transition. Uh, one of the areas that we're really interested in exploring further uh, are the minerals that feed into uh, whether renewables or uh, into uh, battery storage technologies. Um, if these things are going to get to scale globally, uh, it has serious implications in terms of where they're developed and how they're developed. Um, I would also move, one of the key areas is in the Indo-Pacific. Uh, in July uh, 2018, Secretary Pompeo announced a new uh, commitment to the Indo-Pacific region, focused on three areas, uh, the digital economy, infrastructure, and energy. Uh, and I'm leading the interagency focus on energy. And then last, uh, I'm delighted to be here in this part of the world because uh, we're really focused on new opportunities in, uh, in the Middle East. You know, you just mentioned the initiative that was launched by Secretary Pompeo last year, and it's known as Asia Edge. And Edge standing for uh, enhancing development and growth through energy. So tell us about that initiative, because this particular forum is focused on Asia and the Middle East. Yeah, thank you. Uh, Asia Edge is a, is a new concept. Uh, what we're doing is bringing a whole-of-government approach uh, in, tor in, in, in terms of energy. So what does that mean? We have seven different federal agencies involved, a true whole-of-government approach uh, involving uh, all of the agencies you would anticipate, but also looking to leverage finance through the Overseas Private Investment Corporation to look at new opportunities. Uh, of course, as you well know, Asia is the growth engine for the world in terms of energy. We're seeing paradigm shifts moving from the Atlantic Basin to the Pacific in terms of energy trade flows. We have new markets, and of course, U.S. energy abundance uh, is helping to create a level of liquidity that never existed before. Um, so we're very eager uh, to partner and continue to have discussions with governments as well as companies. I should, I should also note, Asia Edge programs uh, is, uh, are built around partnership. Um, we work in a collaborative way with governments to provide the appropriate enabling environments that help them get the investments that they need to develop a new path of energy as, as they see fit in their own uh, self-determination. But what's the applicability of Asia Edge for here, for the Middle East? And maybe you also share with us, I think uh, the audience will really be keenly interested in hearing about your stopover in Oman before you got here and another initiative that was launched that also has relevance and a kind of a comparability to Asia Edge. Yeah, thank you. Of course, they're very different uh, geographic regions, but there are some commonalities. Um, both areas, one of, the, one of the key focus areas, let's focus on Asia Edge first. We're looking to uh, support and strengthen the energy security of friends and allies in the region. 
Uh, secondly, we're looking to uh, ensure uh, open, efficient, transparent energy markets. Third, we want to uh, provide for uh, free, fair, and reciprocal trade of energy. And last, the issue uh, that we had some earlier discussions about, open access for, of, of affordable and reliable energy for all. It's, re it's a really a, a development pathway uh, which we believe the private sector can harness. Turning to this region, um, you spoke about a, 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 the event in Oman, uh, which I should also note, Secretary Pompeo in his speech in Cairo uh, referred to the issue. Um, we launched what's known as the Middle East Strategic Alliance. Uh, it's, a, it's an initiative um, which has a couple different uh, 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 themes. Uh, what we launched in Oman was the, uh, the economic pillar of which energy is the cornerstone. Um, the participating countries were all of the GCC countries plus Egypt and Jordan. Um, we had robust dialogue uh, and was co-chaired by the Secretary General of the GCC uh, and uh, Oman's Foreign Minister. It was a wonderful discussion. Uh, what we're looking to do is find opportunities to note the significant growth and demand of energy here. I mean, a minimum 6% growth year on year and, and upwards into double digits depending on the country. Um, so there's significant need and there's significant opportunity. What's the next step on that initiative that you're envisioning, by the way? Yes, thank you. Uh, what we're, what we're, we're going to convene again, the, the, the countries. We have a couple of, uh, it's, it's, it's in development, but we're looking to do is have some follow-up actions across different work streams um, that uh, each of the, the member states uh, can find commonality. I would note the, the work that we've done in the context of Asia, uh, or excuse me, uh, MESA, uh, uh, in the context of the energy economic pillar, uh, is, is really based on the recognition that uh, all of the countries uh, have already issued their own domestic energy policies, and some of them are very ambitious. Um, and, and so what we're seeing is what are the commonalities across these countries? How is the GCC's uh, work uh, that they've already been doing in terms of energy resilience and electricity, um, what are these commonalities and where's the opportunities for greater cooperation? Uh, we see great promise here uh, and, and significant interest. It sounds great. So we can expect to see you back here, right? I look forward to it. <laughs> Good. Um, let me also ask you, I think there would be a great interest here in given the background of many of the participants here, of what are some of the kinds of challenges that you see uh, from where you're sitting in, in the region, and also what are the opportunities that could be seized upon? Yeah, thank you. Uh, I, I guess there is no, as, as, as the attendees at this conference are well aware, there is no uh, not every country is the same. We've got different, um, uh, different status in terms of relative wealth, uh, geographic differences, uh, and resource endowment differences. Um, um, and, and, and some of the other areas around uh, some of the economic architecture that each country has, uh, there's, a, there's a variability here. Um, but therein are the, are the, are the opportunities as well. Uh, we see uh, countries really changing uh, the way in which uh, really reforming, making domestic reforms in terms of energy. Uh, you know, as I mentioned, the demand growth is, is, is tremendous here. Um, that creates market opportunity for, for the private sector. Uh, and what we've seen is a real uh, stepping up by the governments in the region uh, to reform the way in which energy is priced and traded, um, allowing for uh, energy to be priced so that new types of energy can, can compete with existing sources. Is that what you're hearing also from the leaders who you've met with in the region? Absolutely. I, I, I was, uh, I've been struck by, um, by the willingness and the, and the action of the leadership in, in these countries. Um, they're really uh, very much open uh, to markets and looking at a new way of, of pricing energy. It's not, it's, it's never easy. These, these, these are challenges. Um, but but I, I think we ought to also recognize um, when they're making great strides. You know, the private sector is certainly the engine of growth. And in this regard, you have uh, really a significant representation of the business community here. 
how do you see the role of the business community? I mean, what's the, uh, the nexus and the action that you see there? Well, the business community uh, it will be the driver, whether it's in the Indo-Pacific or here. Uh, governments create the appropriate levels of the types of enabling environments to f facilitate investment and, and, and the private sector, uh, the business community are the ones, the actual change agents in, in, in most regards. Especially with, the, as I mentioned, the, 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 the transformation in terms of uh, new markets. And, and part of this, as I mentioned, it is, it is the direction and the vision of many of the governments in terms of their own energy policies. Um, whether they're seeking to, whether they're renewable, uh, new, new renewable uh, goals and objectives. There's a, there's a variance of ambition, but until there is the appropriate kind of pricing of energy, those can't compete against a, a form of energy that's, that's going to, has been, you know, heavily subsidized. Um, so by opening these up, by allowing parity of, of electrons, not the provenance of them, um, it, it, it means uh, that, that the private sector, again, the demand growth, uh, it, it, it's, it's, it's a new world of opportunity. One of the other issues that has really come to the forefront uh, during the summit has been the issue of the Eastern Mediterranean and you know, the future of gas. How does that fit in, in, in your picture? Is that, you know, you focused on, uh, and what are the elements that you see as part of that future? Yeah, thank you. I, 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 I was in the, in the region in November, and, and it, it's, it's dynamic. It's, it's still nascent. Where, where, were, where were you? I, I was in Israel, Cairo, and Nicosia in Cyprus. Uh, and so uh, I was in Greece prior to that, and, and so, so the, but the opportunities here are tremendous, and the level of um, recognition of energy trade flows from supply to demand centers, which could catalyze new export into Europe and to other markets, it, it's, it's, it's really striking, and there's the recognition uh, of, of just relative comparative advantages in, in energy that the countries recognize this and to, to advance the development of their own populations. Again, and I mentioned uh, some of the market reforms. Um, the, 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 uh, the government of Egypt has made tremendous strides in this regard. Uh, they've also uh, you know, upped their, 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 uh, their payments to, to uh, make good on those payments to companies that have been investing in their countries. Um, again, these are, these are politically can be challenging uh, reforms. Um, but they're ye you're now starting to, to yield the benefits of making them. But let's take that, they're in this process of reforms, but what do you see as a type of a next scenario that would be unfolding in the uh, Eastern Mediterranean, potentially? Yeah, uh, the, de the development of new infrastructure, the tying back of, I mean, it, it, you, you could see a, a envision almost like the uh, Egypt area becoming like the Louisiana of, of, of the Eastern Mediterranean with pipelines going in and out to demand centers, with LNG export facilities, uh, exporting gas to, to Europe and, 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 and points all around the world. Um, again, it's early stages, but it's a significant promise, significant new volumes of gas. And this is, this is, this is gas that, you know, we didn't know existed 15 years ago. And here we are. You know, we were talking about the announcement made by Secretary Pompeo uh, last uh, uh, year over in the summertime where the announcement about Asia, Asia Edge was, was put forward. But it was also in that speech when he put forward the concept of Indo-Pacific. And I'm raising it because share with us what that concept means because there's a new element in it in terms of looking at India and what India brings to the table in terms of the equation of Asia. It's not just Asia anymore, it is Indo-Pacific. So what are the ramifications of that for energy and uh, energy policy? Yeah, the, well firstly I should note, you know, the United States of course is an Atlantic nation, but it's also a Pacific nation. And, uh, and, and so we, we are engaged and have been engaged in the region for a very, very long time. The, the, the kind of verbal expansion of the, to the Indo-Pacific, I think it's just a clear recognition um, of, uh, of, of, of the growth that's occurring there. I mean, we were talking earlier, when you have, uh, you know, Mr. Modi 
seeking to electrify 500 million people for the first time and do it in a six-year time, time horizon, I mean, the scale of what we're talking about is just tremendous. Uh, and, and, and so there's this tremendous opportunity. So uh, I think it's a natural outgrowth of just the, the energy market development that's occurring because of these demand uh, requirements. And then I was struck by the fact that earlier this morning, uh, our president of the Atlantic Council, Fred Kemp, one of the questions that he posed to one of the first panels, he said, well, what about China? Where does China fit into, into things? So can you say a few words about that uh, relevant to uh, U.S. energy policy? Yeah, uh, China, uh, of course, they're, they're a significant consumer. Um, and, and we anticipate they'll continue to be. Um, they, uh, they're also a competitor. Uh, they're, they're in the markets too. Um, but we believe that, uh, of course, coming from the U.S. government, that the, the United States uh, industry is the best in the world, the best health, safety, and environment records, the best technology, the best innovation, uh, and uh, the best workers. Um, so we, what we're looking to do is ensure a level playing field. Um, I mentioned uh, the point about Europe. Uh, but just as a uh, uh, no single supplier should be able to use energy as uh, a means of, of, of political influence, no single buyer should either. Uh, and, and what we really seek is, is, is to create open, transparent markets that allow for a level playing field, um, because only there will we be able to see uh, true, transparent energy pricing. Um, I mentioned the, the significant reforms that are occurring in this part of the world. Uh, but we also see the, uh, the, the, the evolution of new markets uh, in the Indo-Pacific. Uh, it's for the market to participants decide, really, in my view, how, how uh, markets form, where hubs are established. Uh, but we think that's appropriate as long as it's not done uh, through undue political influence. And let me also ask you, at some of the uh, side uh, discussions I've been involved in here, there's been a focus on new technologies and the role of new technologies and innovation relevant to energy. How about that? How does that factor into your equation? Are, are there certain aspects or certain areas that are really exciting you and that today and that you're focused on? Yeah, it's a, it's a, it's a really poignant question. I guess I, I reflect on, of course, the, uh, the U.S. being the biggest oil and natural gas ex, uh, producer now, it, it gets a lot of the attention, but I think it's also worth noting that the U.S. is also the second biggest renewables producer. Um, so the takeaway here is that uh, renewables uh, grew with oil and gas together. A and I was struck by my meetings in Oman, uh, and I learned there that there's a new there, the solar facility, uh, which is being used, it's this novel technology uh, to create high volume of steam, which is then injected for enhanced oil recovery. So you see this harnessing of multiple types of energy together to yield a better return. Um, I see that as an exciting, exciting uh, development. Uh, and I think that having both technology, innovation, and market signals is just going to allow those small examples to flourish. And let me also just ask you about the nuclear area. That's another area that's been touched upon and covered here. And and uh, there are representatives here who focus extensively on it. And in this region, that's also been part of the equation. Uh, what do you see for the nuclear area and its, its growth? Yeah, I, I think, uh, you know, we very much pursue an all of the above energy, and which a, a approach, a policy in the U.S. government, which- Meaning a diversified Diversified, approach. that's right, of which nuclear is, a, is, a, is an important part. Um, what I've been learning, hearing from some of the experts here, uh, is the innovation that's occurring in the nuclear industry. Um, we're really looking at, it seems like a lot of the arguments or the discussions that we've been having um, seem dated from what I'm learning today. Uh, the next generation of nuclear is, is, a, is a whole other thing entirely. Uh, the, the innovation of small modular reactors um, can allow for the deployment uh, of nuclear energy um, and it allows you to pace it without the, the, the overwhelming 
traditional capital constraints that allow that that, that inhibited its deployment. So I think it's an exciting area, and we seek to uh, promote it. And finally, let me just ask you: in looking out at our audience, and again, knowing that you have a lot of business representatives here, not only, uh, but you know, people who care about this issue of energy. What's your message to them? Uh, what message would you like to impart and would you like to leave with them? Uh, firstly, I, I would say thank you for helping to change the world. Uh, the, the energy, and this goes back to the, the discussions in Oman, the reason why we're, we're so focused on this is because we recognize that energy is foundational to economic security, which is foundational to political stability and peace. Uh, it's all connected. And I believe, having worked in industry, of course, I'm a bit biased, but I believe uh, uh, that, that uh, we're change agents, uh, the industry, and, and there, it's, it's providing for a better world. What I would say specifically, and I would say it's a bit of a request, uh, is, is to come and t share your ideas. Um, again, I mentioned in the spirit of Asia Edge, uh, it's one of partnership. And, and we, we understand that the, the innovators are, are the, is the private sector. So we're open. Uh, come and talk to us. Look forward to your help. Well, thank you. Assistant Secretary Fannin, really thank you so much for coming here today to Abu Dhabi. We're really delighted that you uh, were in the region and that we could have uh, the benefit of hearing your views. So please join me in thanking the Assistant Secretary. Thank you.